welcome to the February edition of Tamil Innovators by TamilCulture.com. I'm your host, Arnie Roskumar. Today, I'm very pleased to introduce Mr. Saeed Selvam. He is the Managing Director at New West Public Affairs. He is an entrepreneur, he has been a political candidate, and he was most recently a policy lead at Google. Um, so welcome, Saeed. Thank you so much for joining, with, joining us today. Thank you, Arnie. Thanks so much for having me, and I'm happy to be here. Amazing, amazing. I'm particularly um, excited to have you here today with us um, uh, on a day that Toronto politics is kind of in the news and the media in the light that, you know, we're, we're not used to seeing, but uh, we don't need to delve into that. I think I'll start off by maybe asking you to quickly introduce yourself to our audience members. Sure. Yeah. So again, thanks for having me and a uh, big warm hello to everybody. So my name is Saeed Selvam. I've spent the past 15 years or so in public policy and public affairs. I founded a nonprofit organization. I had an opportunity to run for office, work in government, but also work in tech. My current role is the managing director of New West Public Affairs, where I focus on government relations. So that's basically advocating for companies and conveying some of their priorities to different levels of government, specifically here in Ontario with the Ontario government, but also the federal government as well. So throughout my career, the thing that's been common has been politics, public affairs, communications as well. But um, I've been following the great work of Tamil culture for quite some time. So really happy when I got the invite. Great, thanks for that. Um, a lot to delve into with your experience. Um, so, Said, the 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 topic of polarized identities and uh, polarized world is is something that we see quite often, or we hear quite often. I think now, um, how would you define it? Yeah, it's um, it's challenging, but I can speak to one of my recent experiences at Google. So when I was at Google, I was responsible for fighting misinformation worldwide. And, you know, having an opportunity to see misinformation come in at scale from all over the world was surprising. Uh, it, was, it was also kind of frustrating because you have a front row seat to seeing how big of a problem misinformation and thus polarization is. And we're in a time in history right now where you can actually see um, not just countries in some cases being torn apart in democracies, but also in many cases, families and friends. Like, I don't know how many of us have had interesting experiences where um, no matter what side of the fence you were on when it came to stances on vaccines, um, you knew of somebody who either was against it or for it. And as a result of that, ended some relationships because of because of the differences in opinion. So um, I've seen just how acutely misinformation and polarization has affected countries and people. And one of the biggest problems that I'm starting to see now is that because institutions, especially like political institutions, mm -hmm. have been so um, so brought down in terms of their their credibility, um, and there's been such a mistrust around political institutions, it is becoming extremely problematic to get people on the same page again. Right. Is kind of what I wanted to ask you. If you see, what are some real life problems, maybe something more relatable? Like you kind of spoke to that actually with the vaccines. Do you have any other examples of something um, where polarization is actually creating some real life problems or what are like the larger consequences maybe um, that we could see? Well, look, with the rise of AI, it's a big issue right now, especially with things like deep fakes. Um, it's very difficult to tell what's real and what's not online, especially when, when I was at Google, when Russia invaded Ukraine, the Russian government started pumping out a lot of propaganda and they started putting that on YouTube. And the senior executives at the time made a decision to strike um, those channels and make sure that they weren't publishing anymore. And that was to prevent some of that propaganda from coming up. Now, the challenge here is 
there are people on the side of the fence where they feel like that's squashing free speech, right? So there's a certain mm-hmm. argument that people make and they say, oh, you know, that's, that's squashing free, pe- free speech, whereas others are like, oh, no, that's propaganda and it's very harmful because then it starts to convince people about things that are not necessarily true. So, that, you know, that's an example of a real world issue where, you know, there are lives at stake. It's a very serious issue. It's an actual war. Um, but that's what leads in some cases to people on the ground here nowadays um, who, believe it or not, are actually in support of Russia. And many people believe what, you know, the Russian government is saying about Ukrainians because they've actually seen it somewhere. Somebody sent them a WhatsApp message or an email. So it's, um, mm. it's, a, it's a tough time for, for politics and truth and facts and evidence. But, you know, I have hope for the future. But the, where the actual change is going to happen is on the ground level, on the one-to-one level, where people actually start to educate themselves. The problem is, given what's happening right now in society, where people are so busy with other things, whether it's cost of living, whether it's inflation, the last thing people have time to do is look into fact-checking or evidence. You know, Oftentimes, the way people interact with politics is very very quick. It's very convenient. Oftentimes you just see a tweet or you see an article. And because so many of us are in actual echo chambers that we don't even realize this is something that I, I had to come to the realization of when I was running for office, just how much of an echo chamber I was in. Mm -hmm. Uh, But because we're in echo chambers, everything around us from the media that we consume to the friends that we hang out with oftentimes reinforce our views. And because those views are reinforced, uh, it's very difficult to think outside that box. That's very interesting, actually. Um, and you said politics is consumed like quite quickly. I, I think that we actually consume a lot of things super quickly now, just with the rise of social media, to be honest. Like if I'm on TikTok, it's like 10 seconds of things. And, you know, I can get anything from memes to politics on it, but that's how kind of the information kind of flows these days, right? So I'm wondering, do you think social media has a uh, part to play in the magnification of polarization so far? Yeah, they do. And I think that's why a lot of the a lot of politicians have, in many cases, criticized big social media companies. And a lot of it is warranted. Some of it is is not. Um, but social media companies, like even when I was at Google, are actually taking part in trying to figure out a solution. So um, that's why there's a lot of things like content moderation and even things that you hear about on TikTok where people have a button, staff have a button that can make things go viral. Like little things like this that you hear about that are uh, kind of like, eh, you know, like, should this be happening? Should they have that? Like, it, you know, that's debatable. But the fact is, it's like these platforms have control over content in many cases. Um, but because of that, they have a responsibility to use that control appropriately and responsibly. And when they don't, that's when you have critics from different sides saying like, oh, you're engaging in censorship, right? Mm. So that, that's a big issue, right? Like when Joe Rogan says something or, or Donald Trump says something and it gets um, struck or the video gets banned, you know, a lot of people who are in support of those folks, they'd be like, okay, or in support of what they're saying would basically say, oh, YouTube took it down. So that's a, it's a bunch of, liberal lefties who are running the platform they just don't like trump or they just don't like joe rogan therefore they're engaging in censorship so it's like we're living in a time right now where people are listening to respond as opposed to listening to understand and Mm -hmm. that's it's it's being magnified um 10 times over by what's happening again societally because people are just so busy and because attention spans are shrinking and because things like tiktok are um, are able to attract attention in like six seconds instead of 15 seconds, which was a, a minute before, you know, mm-hmm. because of this, uh, it's, it's not good news for, for things like facts and evidence. So I'm curious to see, I'm, I would think that governments and policymakers would be able to identify this issue and have put in something in place to kind of mitigate polarization. Um, Do you 
think that there is anything in place that's currently working well, or is there uh, room for improvement? It's such a big issue, and I think that's the challenge. Because it's such a big issue, and because now people are so emotionally tied to some of their positions, mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult for one government or one organization to try and address it. Like This is something where it can only be changed via one-to-one -one conversations you know it's like how do you how do you change a racist mind you know it's like it's it's one of those things where you have to kind of sit down and and level with people and, and that's something that we're just lacking writ large from political discourse to culturally like culturally it's all about the individual it's all about me 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 it's all about um money you know so when we when we live in a culture like that it's very difficult to kind of get back to um, ask not what your country can do for you. You know, like that type mm -hmm. of sentiment no, is, no longer exists. I feel like if a president or a prime minister came out with that sentiment nowadays, they'd be mm -hmm. like, what do you mean? You know, like, what, what can I do for you? It's like, what can you do for me? You know, it's like, I right. pay my taxes, right? So it's like, we're in a very different time um, but because we're in a different time it calls for a different approach and a different measure and I think that um, what's been consistent throughout history is that you know people are people everybody has certain basic needs um, and when you deal with with increasing costs but now an individualistic culture coupled with social media it's it's a recipe for for disaster when it comes to like getting people politically engaged. Like we're seeing writ large, there has been a decrease in people wanting to run for office, especially good candidates, because why mm -hmm. would they um, when you get battered, completely battered by the public? Uh, there has been a decrease in charitable donations, and there's been a decrease in um, community and civic engagement, as in like taking part in volunteer activities, community associations, et cetera. And I think that the pandemic has a little bit to play, has a little bit of a part to play in this uh, because we're also coming out of being isolated as well. So it's kind of hard to get back into the social swing of things, but it's just like historic compounding problems all happening at once um, where, you know, in terms of finding yourself in this and, and where do you find kind of your peace and, and your, um, your happiness, that's where it comes down to being like, okay, it's, it's, an, it's important to really take all this into consideration and focus on maintaining mental health, focusing on personal routines and focusing on you know community and building that community, whatever that may be for you. Awesome. Speaking of community, how do you think um, polarization looks in, the Tamil community in the West. Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I um, I was so I've I was born in Canada. Um, my dad is is Tamil, and uh, my mom is Trinidadian. So um, and and then I grew up in a very Portuguese area. So <laughs> you know I I didn't have I, I wasn't you know as fortunate enough as many others to grow up in a very Tamil community. But from what I do know about the community and from friends and, and family, polarization exists in the same way that it does, I think, just writ large, which is you have some people who take certain stances on things. Like, again, there's the vaccine debates. Like, I know there's, there's friends and family who um, are for the vaccine. There's friends and family in the same family who are against it, you know? And it's like, there's only so much reasoning you can, you can try and do, but... Um, I think within the community itself, what I have seen as a strength is um, uniting around what's happening, I think, back home in Sri Lanka. I think um, uniting as a community, though, and empowering one another as a community, I think that needs to happen a little bit more in terms of supporting each other. Um, mm -hmm. There are other communities out there that do a really, really good job of supporting their own. And that's why they're dominating in many fields from entertainment to politics to business. And yes, our community is doing well in some of those fields, but we could be doing a lot better in terms of that support. So um, I think that there's a lot of 
competition in the community. I think that, you know, the, the old school gossip and, and stuff <laughs> like that doesn't do anyone any favors. Um, but I think there's extreme potential within the community itself to, to take it from, you know, good to great. Right. Do you also think that you know, inherently every community has like a, a negative or some, like something like gossip or something, competition, something going on there. Do you think that the, so the Tamil community, especially in Canada, there's a lot of us. So we have the unique opportunity to come across many of us, especially in the GTA. And we have all these organizations um, where, you know, you could advance your career or you could network or you could learn about your educational field. Um, so is the, and the idea there is that you then start to identify as Tamil and you connect with these Tamil people. So is our need to identify as Tamil, um, would that stunt us from being able to identify with our broader community and dare I say, being polarized with them in various other realms. Yeah, no, I, I don't think so. I think if anything, being Tamil should be celebrated. I think we should wear it loud and proud, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I think one thing that needs to happen is, is also taking that identity and taking that pride and, and intermingling and intermixing with other communities as well, like more so. And I think that's what kind of takes you to the next level. Like when I was a community organizer, and working with uh, a few Tamil organizations. I remember there was a lot of timidness among young people who were told by their parents to kind of like, oh, and these were young people who are passionate about like community issues and, and politics and they wanted to, to go and say stuff publicly, but they're like, oh, like, Amma Napa tell me, you know, I shouldn't basically, um, I shouldn't shake things up, right? And it was a kind of attitude where it's like, you should be grateful to be here in this country. And therefore, as a result of that gratitude, you should kind of keep it down and be quiet. Uh, but I think gratitude is, is, um, is when you also recognize, yes, what, what type of country you're in and, and being grateful for it, but that doesn't stop you from calling, um, calling out truths and, and speaking out. So, you know, I think that there, I think it's happening right now in the community, again, like from, from our community, um, starting to kill it in media and do stuff online and um, even run for office. I think it's starting to happen, um, but it's a community that has a lot to be proud of, you know, and I think that in terms of the, the attitude of you're a guest here, you're not a guest in your own country, especially a country that you live in and, and you've, in some cases, were born in or you have the opportunity to um, have immigrated to. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity and I think it's, um, you know, sky's the limit. Awesome. So speaking as someone who was born and raised here, I grew up in Mississauga. So I had a lot of multicultural friends, not so much like the typically Tamil um, sort of upbringing, but I had a lot of family friends. When I, when I really met um, Tamil people was, at university. So I went to the University of Waterloo, like I told you. And so I started to notice a trend on the micro level, which was groupthink. And I feel like groupthink is something that is tied to polarization. You know, you hear a lot now. And I've even noticed since then that, and this is my community, so I see the groupthink there, but I, I can see that it would relate to other communities as well. It's this idea of you know, finding your people and you guys all have one opinion on one subject and that's what we're going to take. We're going to die on that hill, right? So, and then it creates this echo chamber that you were talking about because you find like-minded people, they agree with it, then you just keep growing this echo chamber and no one's really refuting it. And if people are refuting it, we're pushing them out. So inevitably from the way I'm describing it, it seems like a negative thing. Um, do you agree with that? Do you think there are any pros to groupthink, the groupthink mentality? I think it helps, especially when you're united against a common enemy or a common right. issue that's affecting the entire community. Um, so unifying 
a mentality or a view or a value really helps when you're advocating to change something. Even in my line of work, um, you know, one of the things we tell clients is that if you're going to talk to a minister, or you're going to talk to the prime minister or a premier, and you want something changed, don't hit them with 20 different opinions or, or a list of 20 different things you want changed. Hit them with one, right? Because mm -hmm. it's easier for them to digest. It's easy. And oftentimes it takes a lot of time for certain things to change because they're such big issues. So I think in that regard, it's, it's beneficial. Uh, but I think in an individualistic culture that, that starts to value the individual along with, with the culture as well, it's important to kind of differentiate yourself. Um, and if you feel differently about something, then say it, but also you know, feel free to kind of engage in discussion about it. And I think right now, because again, people are so emotionally tied to certain opinions or certain facts and not really being open-minded as much as maybe before, um, it's harder to, to have conversations with people. Like now it's very difficult to um, have coffee, have lunch, have dinner with someone you disagree with than it was a long time ago because it's almost like when you disagree with somebody nowadays, the respect also goes too. It's like you can disagree with somebody, but you can still respect them. And even that's going. So it's mm -hmm. just like, that's, what's, that's what makes um, having diverse opinions within a culture kind of kind of difficult. And we're seeing it, like we're just seeing it all over the place. Um, so that's something that I do hope changes, but um, you know, it's up, to, it's up to leadership in the communities or also people who are, who are outspoken to, to change that. Right. And like you said, it happens kind of in a smaller scale first, right? In, in the micro level. And so when I think of the micro level, I'm thinking of friend groups, families, but even the workplace, which is an interesting sort of realm, because I remember being told that, you know, if you're in a workplace, you follow the set criteria that they, they give you, but then I was always encouraged in school to kind of speak up and have my own opinion, but you present it in the right way. Nowadays, I feel like once you're in a workplace and you know the culture, you know what will be a yes and what will be a no. And I don't know if people even see value in thinking the other way or bringing it up. And I, I, I wonder if people switch sides just to fit in, um, which obviously poses a lot of risk in a workplace. I don't know if workplaces have risk mitigation um, tactics for this. What, what's, your, what's your take on that? So you're talking about having a difference of opinion within a workplace culture? Yeah, like are, are they more so polarized now where we're all thinking one way and we're gonna do business one day or, or one way? Or do you think that there still are, there's value um, or businesses see value of um, the various opinions? Oh, I, I think, I think, of course, I think nowadays, more than ever before, I think it's very difficult to have a difference of opinion, either with your boss or within, within the corporate culture coming right. from, coming from corporate. Um, if you, if you had a difference of opinion with your superiors, uh, and of course, this varies from company to company, but I'd say for the most part, it is very difficult to have a difference of opinion and have it respected unless you are respected or valued valued enough within the company to kind of be indispensable. Um, it's 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 challenging. I think um, a lot of companies are monoliths. I think that they um, nowadays there's a lot less care for individual opinions or innovation, even in some companies that are branded as innovative. Um, and we're seeing that right now with quote unquote whistleblowers who are writing. Um, articles about their times at some very popular companies. So I think it's, I think it's challenging to have your own opinion. And, and in terms of, is it worth it though? Right. Like mm -hmm. my, my advice before this, in terms of like speaking out and stuff like that was kind of like, you know, population wise or like politics wise, but I don't want to get that confused with you kind of, um, you know, walking into work one day and being like, F this, F that, I want to do yes. things differently. You know, I, right. I, I think um, you have to do what's best for you, especially when it comes to like your economic and financial survival. 
So, you know, it, it's about being very careful at work and understanding the, the game that you're playing uh, within the workforce. I can say very interestingly enough, where I currently work, um, you know, we actually have a very multi-partisan team and we, we are actually, you know, steeped into politics, right? My, my firm was founded by a conservative cabinet minister. Um, I would consider myself a progressive. There's folks from the NDP, there's folks from the liberals there. So it's, uh, it's an amazing company because everybody respects everybody's opinion. It's not like people are fighting each day. So I think that, you know, it depends on the workplace and it depends on the leadership. That's why it's so important nowadays to have good leaders. Um, but, you know, I've, I've definitely been a part of companies as well, where it's like, if you think differently or you try and speak up or you try and challenge um, the traditional views of senior leadership or managers, it's not uh, it, it's it's not received well, and it doesn't bode well for you as an employee. I get that. Um, you know, I don't know how many of us would go into the workplace, you know, screaming profanity one day, like, man, I don't want to be polarized. This is it for me. But where I do see that it could be done that way is with family. So, like you had spoken before. During the pandemic, there the biggest debate was, you know, the vaccine or the mask. Um, and there was a lot of group chats that were inevitably exploding with fights and whatever. But like you said, I see that it's been translated to more and more issues and people tend to debate, argue. But like you said, the respect is also starting to wean off. Do you think this trend of, you know, you agree with me, we are friends, or you don't agree with me, we're not friends, do you think that's going to continue on? Um, and as a result, will polarization continue to grow? Or do you think there is potential for people to kind of realize that, you know, maybe there's value in someone seeing something a different way? I think that there's opportunity and potential, of course, but it takes nowadays a certain level of maturity to understand that just because someone disagrees with you um doesn't mean that they're an enemy you know right. and that if you when, when we come to understand that as like a people in general i just mean as humans because it's just happening worldwide with every culture every every race for the most part um i think once we come to understand that things will be better but again, it starts from, from leadership. Like we have to see this displayed at the highest levels. And because even like the state of politics has completely deteriorated um, and has become very uncivilized, it's very difficult then to expect the population to follow. Like at some point, um, you know, years ago, uh, probably even centuries ago, leaders were representatives of the way the world should be as opposed to the way the world is and nowadays because leaders are so power hungry they are constantly reacting but also reflecting to the way the world is right leaders mm -hmm. are supposed to kind of tell us not necessarily what we wanted to know but what we needed to know and right now it's all about there's it's almost like um like companies like companies have very little incentive to to tell you what you need to know that's why companies they respond directly to mar the market. You know, the market says like, we want these color shoes and they're selling out. So therefore they, they you know, make more shoes or you want, um, you know, McDonald's. There's McDonald's on like every corner. We want more McDonald's. McDonald's is not necessarily good for you, but it's like, hey, the market is asking for it. Who are we to tell them no? So that, that's like private industry, that's corporations. But politics and politicians are supposed to be different. Like they're supposed to be a certain class of leader i think originally like when when these countries were being founded they were supposed to be a certain type of leader that was um noble and um had all the facts come to them make a decision and even if something was unpopular they would still do it because it it furthered the betterment of society either in the short run or the long run and nowadays you just don't have that courage you just don't have that backbone because it could mean that you have to defend your position or you could lose an election 
Okay. That you know gives us a lot to think about, especially on leadership, right? Mm, but okay, so maybe to wrap up, I'll ask you this question: What do you use as a tool to mitigate polarization within your own echo chamber? Like you said, what what do you use to kind of mitigate this so you're not part of the echo chamber? You know, throughout my life, I'd say throughout my like last 15 years, mm -hmm. I put myself into positions that I have been uncomfortable in because I feel like discomfort leads to growth. So speaking to people I don't necessarily agree with or going into rooms that don't have people necessarily who reflect me, whether it's you know physically, racially, age-wise, I'm oftentimes, even nowadays, either the darkest person in the room or the youngest person in the room. And, mm. you know, being in rooms like that, um, and in many cases, some of these rooms are, are very powerful. It's, it's an opportunity and it's a privilege, but at the same time, when you're, you're, the, you're the person, um, it feels a little lonely, it feels a little isolating, but you get over that by being like, okay, what can I take from this experience? How can I um, give back based on me being one of the few in this room? and many others not having the opportunity to be in the same room. Um, but, you know, make, make no mistake, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's scary when it first happens. You know, again, to be in a very uncomfortable room, which I've been in now many, many, many times, is just like, you wish there was more folks that you could relate to. So that's, okay. That's one kind of wish that I would love to have. But yeah, I mean, in terms of personal growth and things like that, it's always kind of throwing myself into certain situations where I kind of get the courage to do it after I do it. Right. That's awesome. That's some great advice, actually, that I think a lot of us should take um, because we are used to finding the person that looks like us and kind of being comfortable but once you're uncomfortable you take on the burden but you're making a difference so thank you for being that person in all of these rooms for us yeah, yeah um, <laughs> but hey this was a great chat super super interesting I have a lot to think about myself um, of you know particularly leaders and how this is kind of affecting us but hey thank you so much Saeed for joining us on the February edition of Tamil Innovators by TamilCulture.com of course, thanks for having me.